About 10 years ago, my friend Bill, who was working uh, doing ministry at a boys' training school for, uh, for uh, kids, was working with an ecumenical Bible study group. Most of the people in the group were Protestants, and one summer they were going through the uh, Gospel of John. Now I asked Bill what happened when they got to John chapter 6, which is, the, we're reading the beginning of John chapter 6 today, and we'll be reading it until late August. The, John chapter 6 is called the Bread of Life Discourse, and it's very Eucharistic. So I was curious what these ecumenical non-Catholics would do with John chapter 6. And Bill said, well, they skipped it. That's an easy answer to a difficult question. And I think we're all faced with the same question in many ways, because in our theology, in our spirituality, we might skip the implications of John chapter 6, or we might skim the implications of John chapter 6, or we might try to compromise with what John is really telling us. It's interesting that with the four Gospels, the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all have a similar uh, encounter with Christ at the Last summer, Supper, and they have about three or four verses to explain the institution of the Eucharist. And the language in each of those three Gospels is very similar to each other, and the language is very similar to what Father will say in a few minutes when he institutes the Eucharist today. In John's Gospel, over 20% of his Gospel, chapters 13 to 17, I think it is, are at the Last Supper. Do you know how many times he mentions the Eucharist in that portion of his Gospel? Zero. He never talks about the formula instituting the Eucharist. Instead, in today's Gospel, in chapter 6, through all of chapter 6, what's called the Bread of Life Discourse, he is teaching why we receive the Eucharist. The other three, maybe this is what the Holy Spirit inspired, three Gospels tell us how to do it, and one Gospel in much more detail tells us why we are doing what we are doing. Now I have a question for you. Was Jesus a nice guy? Was he a nice guy? No, he was the son of God. And that's one of the problems we have when we look at this chapter in John, because it's really easy to look at the miracle today, which is the only miracle that appears in all four Gospels, the multiplication of the loaves, as we call it, and say, isn't that a nice guy? Now, in my business career, I've worked with some wonderful salesmen, and they could talk you out of anything. They could sell refrigerators to Eskimos, as the old saying goes. And I'm sure a really nice guy who was a good salesman could convince us if some of us had brought bread to this event, that we should share it with other people. And that's how some people interpret this miracle. But this is not a nice guy miracle. This is a son of God miracle. And we need to understand what multiplication is, and we need to understand what a miracle is. I remember when I was a kid, this was more of an addition math problem, but. My dad was starting to teach me about fractions before I was in kindergarten. And I understood that if you had a half and a half and you put it together, you would have a whole. So I thought if I had a half of nothing and another half of nothing, I could put it together and have a German Shepherd puppy. Guess what? It didn't work then and it still doesn't work today. Well, whether you are doing addition or multiplication, if we're multiplying loaves, if we go to Costco and there's two loaves of bread in a bag and we buy a thousand bags of bread, multiplication would say two times a thousand, we've got 2,000, we've got enough to feed 5,000 people. But that's not what this multiplication is about. 
This is more like my example trying to get a German shepherd puppy when I was four. Jesus took five loaves of bread and multiplied, multiplied them by nothing and came up to feed 5,000 men plus all the women and children and to have enough left over to fill 12 wicker baskets. People would ask, well, how can you explain? How did he do that? And there's a secret answer. You can't explain how he did it because it is a miracle. You can explain what there was before the miracle, and you can explain what there was after the miracle. And the only way you could explain what happened in between the before and the after is God's intervention. God's intervention. Whether we're talking about a miracle that cures somebody from an incurable disease or a miracle like this, we are talking about the intervention of God. We are talking about the intervention of the Son of God. We are not talking about a nice guy just being kind of kind. Because, you know, if you had a nice guy, you could compromise. If a nice guy said, here's the rules you should follow in your life, we could be like a cafeteria and say, well, you know, I really like uh, gambling, so I'm going to ignore the rules about that. I really like greed, so I'm going to ignore the rules about that. Uh, I like to judge people, too, so I'm going to ignore those rules. And all of a sudden, we're all going in our own separate way. But if the Son of God gives us rules, like he did in the Sermon on the Mount, like he does in Matthew at the end of the Gospel and the judgment of the nations, you could ignore those rules if you want to, but there might be consequences. There might be serious consequences. In today's Gospel, Jesus feeds the people. They're ecstatic. I mean, we all know, and we've all experienced lately, getting free stuff is really, really nice. It's really good. So they want to make him king. Why? They want to keep getting free stuff from him. And he goes off to the distant mountain because that is not the relationship God wants to have with us. He doesn't want to just be providing us with free stuff. He wants to have a different type of relationship with us. And I really encourage you all, when you go home or sometime before now in the end of August, to read all of John chapter 6. Because when we're getting it now as in bits and pieces, it's hard to get the full scope of what Jesus is teaching us about the Eucharist. We do know, though, that he, as his message gets clearer and harder, people start to leave. People start to leave because I think, you know, they have all kinds of cynical excuses. Well, wasn't he the carpenter's son? Is he expecting us to be cannibals when he's talking about eating his body and blood? I don't think that's what people's objections really were. I think those were excuses that they really understood that Christ was coming in self-sacrifice, and if we ate his body and his blood, that he was expecting us to enter into a loving, self-sacrificial relationship. If he was just a nice guy, when he got to the part I'm going to mention near the end of the Gospel. See, normally we would be going all the way through, I think it's August 22nd with these readings, but August 15th is the Assumption of the Blessed Mother and a Sunday. So it, the Assumption of the Blessed Mother, the Solemnity, takes precedence. So we're not going to have the readings I'm going to give away today. So I'm not stealing somebody else's homily from next month. When Jesus is getting to the point that people are starting to leave, if he was just a nice guy, if he was not the Son of God, he would say, you know, when I said, eat my body and drink my blood, I was using hyperbole. I was exaggerating for effect. This is what I really meant. But instead, he changes the language he uses. In the reading that we won't have this year, it's near the end of John, 
And in English, unfortunately, we just still have, you must eat my body, you must drink my blood. But in the original Kanoi Greek that John's Gospel was written in, the word for eat is tago, which means gnaw or crunch, like an animal would, a ravenous animal would eat. Jesus wants us to really consume him and really have the benefit of consuming him. How do we explain a miracle? We can only explain it with faith. How do we accept what Jesus is telling us about the Eucharist? A good part of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' greatest work on theology, some people believe it is, the Summa Theologica, is about the Eucharist. If you read all of that book, if you don't have faith, you will not accept the Eucharist. If you read about the many, many Eucharistic miracles that have been happening, at least for the last 800 years, where sometimes, for instance, the priest doubts that he has the ability to institute the Eucharist, and the wine will turn into actual blood, the host will turn into an actual human tissue. If you read about all of those and you read that the blood is always the type of blood that comes from the universal donor, and the tissue is always from a man's heart muscle of a man who is dying a traumatized death, Unless you have faith when you read that, you'll just say, what? Evidence can improve the bridge we have to cross, make it shorter, but we always have to have faith that God is giving us his body and his blood in the Eucharist. And a little bit when we come up to receive communion, the priest, myself, or one of the Eucharistic ministers will hold up the body, the host, and say, the body of Christ. When you respond, amen, remember that what you are responding in its original language means, I believe. Gnaw on what the real presence of Christ is. It is a gift of salvation, a gift of grace. God bless you.